Now, looking around the room here, uh, this is a pretty good-sized room for the topic that we're discussing, uh, India's state's development role. Um, it's, uh, I think the world has long believed that India's development trajectory was driven almost exclusively by New Delhi. And the fact, the fact that we had such powerful leaders in Delhi, uh, thinking back to, um, to Nehru, to Indira Gandhi, to Atal Bihari Vajpayee, um, those figures captured so much attention and, and had vision for the country's development path that uh, that kind of reinforced the fact that um, states, we knew they existed, but nobody considered them to be terribly significant. Uh, even in Delhi, uh, for somebody that spends a good bit of my year in Delhi, um, when I'm running around Delhi and talking about having just visited uh, Bhubaneswar Agartala, it just like going to the moon. You know, they look at that as, uh, where is that? I don't know where that is. The moon I've seen, Agartala seems like it's on another, another part of the universe. So I think uh, DC shares in that as well. Sometimes we sort of forget that the universe continues uh, even outside the beltway. So I think national capitals around the world probably have uh, some, some iteration of that. I do think um, you know, there is a growing understanding, though, that Indian state governments actually exert far more control over people's daily lives. When you think about the delivery of basic public services, power, education, water, health care, even law and order, you know, all these things are predominantly under, under the control of state governments. And when you have a, a state-level figure like Prime Minister Modi uh, taking over national prominence, and as soon as taking office, articulating this vision of cooperative federalism and competitive federalism, getting states to compete to try to attract investment, getting states to cooperate to further national development goals, um, and then to follow that up with real, tangible, substantive reforms that you've seen. You know, I think abolishing the Planning Commission and creating Niti Aayog, and I know a lot of folks look at that and say, it's old wine in a new bottle. No, the Planning Commission's job was five-year plans, which they don't do anymore. So the prime function of the old group is not done by the new group. The consultative way in which they approach their job on pulling together groups of chief ministers to talk about key issues, um, the rankings they do of Indian states on business parameters, on, uh, more recently on health factors, you do see that this promise of cooperative and competitive federalism in a lot of ways has become reality. There is a limited tool set to try to try to initiate that, but I think um, I think the toolkit's a little bit larger than some of us had presumed when Modi first articulated that idea. We've also seen uh, many Indian chief ministers uh, once again become aggressive uh, uh, business diplomats around the world. Uh, this is something I remember seeing in my early days at the U.S. India Business Council when we were organizing a bunch of conferences across Indian states, and chief ministers were visiting. Then there was a period where there was a lot less um, a lot less attention by chief ministers in commercial diplomacy. But that's really picking up again, and it looks like it's not just coming this way, too, but a lot of American governors going that way and, and trying to provide um, uh, the, the other side of things. Uh, I think a lot of the U.S. visitors that are going to India as well, uh, they're remembering that roads don't just stop in Delhi and Mumbai and Bangalore, and maybe if they're crazy, they'll go to Hyderabad or Chennai. That's, that for a long time had been kind of the end of the, of the day for a lot of uh, senior U.S. diplomats for... Um, uh, for U.S. executives, but, uh, but you're slowly seeing an expansion, too, of that circle of the states that we're engaging with. Um, is this a trend that we can expect to continue, um, both in terms of international engagement with states, states' engagement with the world, center state dynamics that we've kind of seen evolve? How do foreign organizations that, uh, that want to do work or are doing work with Indian states, how do they do that more effectively? How do we help Indian states meet their development goals? Where, where are areas they need help? We're areas that you know, American organizations run to Indian states and try to help, but there really isn't necessary. So I think we've got uh, one of the greatest panels here that you could imagine pulling together to have this kind of a conversation for the Washington policy community. Uh, first of all, we're extremely lucky to have two officials having traveled all the way from two uh, key Indian capitals uh, to come and attend the session here today. Uh, Vivek Agarwal, who's Principal Secretary to the Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh, um, and also Commissioner of Urban Development and Housing. So critical areas when you think about development, but also his role in advising uh, the Chief Minister, which, you know, as you know, Madhya Pradesh, uh, you know, we got a bit of a contrast here too, and one of the, one of the longest serving, most stable governments in the country. And Rajiv Bora joins, who is the additional Chief Secretary for the state of Assam, responsible for welfare of tribes, backward classes, science, technology, soil conservation, uh, almost everything under the sun. Previous roles include things like energy and power. And Assam, of course, you recently had a, a government transition there. So, so one of the longest serving governments in Madhya Pradesh, one that uh, went through a transition quite recently. So in, in talking about how that also uh, interplays with development mission. Apart from the, these terrific officials that we've got representing Indian state governments, we got two of the great India hands uh, in this town that know Indian states and, and understand how to operate there uh, so very deeply. 
Uh, first, just to my left is uh, Dr. Jessica Seddon. Uh, Jessica and I first ran across when she was living in Chennai, which uh, I thought just because I visited there five times made me a bit of an expert. But uh, of course, setting up shop, creating one of the great consultancies down there, a copy, and, and she, she and her team uh, came to a number of events, and I realized uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a piker. I mean, here I am in Washington, blah, 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 and just because I know Agatala exists, I feel pretty cool. Uh, Jessica's, uh, Jessica's the, uh, the real deal. Um, just to her left is uh, Dr. Irfan Narudin, who runs the, the India Initiative at Georgetown University. Uh, thank him for giving up a little bit of his time as well, because uh, he's going to be doing all this on Saturday as he holds the India Ideas Conference, uh, which is a fantastic event, terrific speakers. Uh, the only problem is that he went to only the second best school in the state of Michigan, uh, the University of Michigan. I think we all know Grand Valley is the dominant force in Michigan, but you know they try their best, so you know give them a give them a bit of leeway there. Um, so let me uh, let me first start with uh, with Jessica, and uh, then we'll move to to Irfan uh, to kick things off. So Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I have to say that I'm, I'm particularly excited to have be having this conversation because I remember when I first started working in India about 15 years ago or so, the, it, the narrative was that the central government was had been and was leading these incredible reforms, these transformations of the state, the opening of the pri to the private sector, and the states were the curmudgeons, the states were the, the ones who were saying no, the states were the ones who were dragging their feet, who were looking for benefit. and. That, I think, was not quite true, um, even at the time, but that was very much the perception. And I think we've moved to an area where we have a pretty significant propositive power in the realm of the, uh, of the states, in the issues and in the areas that are going to be significant for India's future growth trajectory. So if you look at the things that, and, and I'm going to say a little bit that that propositive power right now is there is more ability for states to take um, I hate the word bold, but bold new uh, action um, on some of these things like employment creation, things like urban development, um, things like water and sanitation, things like investment in a more healthy environment. I mean, many of you may have seen the, some of the air quality challenges, water pollution challenges. There's much more room to act than is presently being taken. But at the same time, I think the climate for independent state level um, initiatives that start to become and influence the national trajectory is a little uncertain. So there's, it, it, there's sort of a window that, that is bigger than what we're seeing, but is also um, a little, uh, you know, maybe closing. So a couple of things is, you know, one, so urban development, um, that's an area that, that's been near and dear to my heart for, for a while. And actually, I, I sort of hate speaking before <laughs> the Commissioner of Urban <laughs> Development, and he may want to contradict me. Um, but having seen uh, the level of attention, both at the state and national level, to both the policy framework as well as public investment in India's cities, um, I think what's been, what's happened, and the the sort of less recognized uh, opportunity that's embedded in the Smart Cities mission, which is something that's often criticized for not being very much money. Um, it's criticized as being very flashy uh, with not as much substance underneath it. However, one of the hidden opportunities that's created in there, and I think this is illustrative of the kind of thing that's been, that's a new opportunity for states to be propositive, but states have to choose to take it. The hidden opportunity in the Smart Cities mission is the creation of these Smart City special purpose vehicles. Which, in some states, so in Tamil Nadu, where, where I most recently moved from, are being treated as a de facto um, nascent integrated planning cell. And it's something that not all states have taken this attitude, and the SPV is not inherently particularly powerful. Um, it has the potential to coordinate, but at the same time, the state has to make a decision to encourage, and this is something that has to come from the chief minister's level, to encourage the various secretaries who work in the agencies that influence urban development to cooperate, to collaborate, to provide data, to um, pay attention to the overall plan and thinking about funding allocations. And I think that's a, sort of a constructive potential opening, but it's something that states have to take. And, and so that's one in, in urban development. In the second areas, and some of these other areas with um, employment creation, with um, looking at water sanitation, uh, things like that, there, there are similar stories about opportunities to attract 
further investment opportunities to change labor laws. In fact, that was something that the central government said to the states. Well, it's your choice. You can decide what to do. Some states have taken that up. Other states haven't. Um, so that's the, the sort of the, the extra room that I think, the, the room that states have to be much more propositive, and I think we're seeing variation in that, which is the positive side. On the negative side of this, or on the kind of closing window for that kind of power, we're also seeing um, a renewal of a level of discretion among the, at the central level for the fund flow to states. So the last finance commission, the 14th finance commission, had an unprecedentedly high allocation of the tax pool to states. And that's untied, that's as, it, I mean, that's the, as envisioned in the constitution. Um, and that fund pool was, again, an opportunity for states. States had to choose to take it. The 15th Finance Commission, and as much as I have a lot of respect for and a lot of affection for the chairman, N.K. Singh, um, he's an old co-author of mine, the most recent news that I saw today is, this, you know, is the statement when he was visiting Tamil Nadu that each state's allocation would be carefully and individually considered. That's a renewal of a sort of discretionary sticks and carrots kind of approach to negotiating with states that that's, is very reminiscent of an older period in which there was much more effort at central control of states. And that's something that I think is only compounded by the fact that we have um, elections coming up relatively soon and there is, uh, in some sense, you know, some party turnover in some states. So that signals that this window of opportunity that states have right now is something that should be valued much more um, because it may be closing soon. And I think with that, I'll end my remarks because I think that the, um, the two officials from state governments may have more to say about uh, exactly the, the opportunities and whether they're closing or not. Uh, Irvan, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. First, you may, let me start by congratulating uh, Thank you. Dan Randy, Rick Crosser, and the CSI team for this incredible conference. As Rick very generously mentioned on Saturday, at Georgetown, we have the India Ideas Conference. I hope to see some of you there. But this is the conference we want to be when we grow up. <laughs> and so it's wonderful uh, to be here this morning. Uh, I won't take a lot of time, but I want to frame a couple of things. And I'll you sort of use the prerogative of being the sole current academic. Of course, Jessica was one of us uh, until she went on to do, you know, do real things with her life as opposed to just talking about other people. Uh, <laughs> but I'll use the role of academic to maybe pose a few thoughts that might come across as critical, and, uh, but uh, just to sort of serve as a counterpoint. So on the one hand, I think the work that Rick and Kartike and his team here at the Vadwani Chair for U.S.-India Policy Studies has done through the Engaging States Forum remains one of the most important new initiatives in Washington for educating the DC policy community about why states are critical actors for understanding uh, policy and development in India. You can stop there. Yeah, done. <laughs> that's a sound bite. That's a sound bite you can tweet out. <laughs> Hashtag CSISGDF, right? It's awesome. um, but I think, uh, I think part of what we lose in sort of this new found appreciation of the states is that, of course, that states have always been the critical player in the Indian political economy. Right? It's worth going back and reading Nehru's uh, letters to his chief ministers. There's a wonderful little volume that Madhav Khosla edited called Letters for a Nation from Jawala Nehru to his chief ministers. And these are literally weekly letters, handwritten letters, that Nehru wrote to all his chief ministers between 1947 and 1950, right? outlining essentially their critical role as leaders of their states in this nascent country of India, and that essentially the work of development was going to have to, have to happen at the state level. Right? This is 47 to 50. Uh, and now, 70 years later, I think what we've all realized is that this is sort of critical, not just because in the states we have incredible talent, uh, as, as exemplified by the two gentlemen, but actually the pure scale of India means that these states are essentially large countries. The state of Maharashtra, where I'm from, uh, I grew up in Bombay. The state of Maharashtra is about 110 million people, right? That is a large European state. Uh, and uh, the state of UP, of course, is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> twice that, right? I mean, if UP was its own country, it would be the fourth largest country in the world in terms of population. You cannot think of those 
as being something that's run out of a capital in Delhi. These have to be understood as being run out of the states because they're essentially doing national level scale policy. And this is true, of course, as, as true in uh, Madhya Pradesh and in Assam as it is in those two other states I just named. So I think the recognition of scale has meant, and the growing scale of the states, has meant that we have to engage the states because that's really where the action's at. When I teach my students, I like to tell them, the central government gets the money, the states spend the money, right? I mean, that's sort of a very uh, back of the envelope way of thinking about the, the way the Constitution conceives of this. What we've had over 70 years is an effort by the central government to try and centralize more power, right? But the fact of the matter is that the real decisions have to be made at the state level. So that's great, and we have to understand that. There are two small, uh, maybe, concerns from an academic perspective that I just want to put on the table, though. One is that one of the reasons that the states have become so attractive is because of the accretion of power to the executive, right? I mean, these are parliamentary systems, uh, so the state, the chief minister is an incredibly powerful person, and the private secretary to the chief minister is maybe even more powerful, <laughs> right? Uh, they're incredibly powerful people, but what we don't have, and I would say this is true both in Delhi and in the state capitals, is any longer a functioning state legislative, legislative system. Right? We do not have legislatures that are doing the work of deliberation and policy planning of setting broad agendas. We have that work being done by incredibly talented and committed bureaucrats uh, that become very useful partners uh, for uh, those of us in Washington, D.C. and in other places who want to do work. And we can walk into an office in, um, you know, in any of these state capitals and find incredibly articulate and intelligent sort of bureaucrats. We almost never will think to go and talk to the local MLAs because, frankly, what would they have to do with the work that we want to do in India? At some point, that strikes me as worth investigating and thinking about what the implications of that are, because you essentially have a bureaucratic uh, structure that runs the state and a political structure <laughs> that is essentially doing its best to make that work harder, right, by, by focusing on a set of issues often that are somewhat at odds of the broader development uh, Agenda. I was just in Bombay in March with a group of students working with the chief minister's office on questions of water and sanitation. And everyone we met, with the exception of the chief minister himself, was a government bureaucrat. We just didn't try to talk to the politicians over there. That seems at odds with the way we would normally think about the work of development in any other part of the world where we normally want to do this stuff. That's one. The second, I think, is the question of what do we see as the real partners for these state governments? So on the one hand, you know, the vibrant Gujarat was the start, magnetic Maharashtra has been another. I'm sure there's a number of these very smart, alliterative, sort of big uh, investment shows that the various states are going. But really, when I think of the states, we see a lot of work now being done in the, f in the fields of service delivery. That is essentially where the state government can be a partner. What I don't see as much of is the states playing the role of facilitating, you know, B2B, kind of stuff, or even G2B or whatever. The, essentially, the state government is still the conduit through which all the work runs. And that seems to me a b bit of a missed opportunity. So if we don't have state as facilitator, we have state as doer. And because, again, of the strengths of the states and the ability of the state to do real stuff, that makes a great deal of sense. But the question is, at what point will these state governments be willing to hand over the reins of power Right, they essentially say, we'll get you guys in the room and then we're going to step out of it. You tell us what you need, we'll get it done. But it doesn't have to be us running the show. Uh, and I think until we get there, we don't allow the states to fully unlock their full uh, potential. So with those sort of as very framing, and I hope not uh, uh, too critical or rude comments, I think the states are incredible engines, but we have to figure out how to essentially let them do the work of democratic politics to facilitate rather than to be the place that we think these are the only guys who can get it done, right, and we don't need to talk to anybody else. Thank you. Well, as we sometimes say in this town, uh, sitting on the outside of government, which a lot of the institutions that think tanks try to provide ideas for, it's a, it's a foggy window looking in. So uh, now it's up to, uh, to Vivek and to Rajiv to tell us if, uh, you know, for, for folks like us, you know, how clear is our view in? Um, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Um, but clearly, a lot of support for both the devolution of states and control, uh, and also support for for the fact that the world is finally waking up. So thanks again for coming out. And uh, Vivek, let's uh, let's start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. In fact, uh, what Professor uh, Irfan was saying, uh, it 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 really is a complex uh, administrative and political structure in India. And if if you have not lived in India, or if you have not understood how India functions. 
for a person coming from outside the country, it, it becomes really difficult to understand how the country is functioning, where the actual power lies, or how the systems are uh, able to deliver, in spite of uh, uh, extremely, uh, I mean, diverse circumstances. As you know, India is uh, India is a very very diverse country. We have different languages, we have different cultures. Even within states, uh, there are regions which have their regional aspirations. Like if you take Madhya Pradesh, it's not a homogeneous unit as a state. We have Bundelkhand, we have Bagelkhand, we have Mahakaushal, we have Malwa. So there are regions with their own language, with their food habits, with their history and legacy. They became a, a, a uh, an administrative unit by virtue of somebody drawing a map post-independence. And some of these states are really homogeneous as well because some of the states have si single language or single culture. But there are states which, which have regions which want to have a separate uh, state structure. So every two or three years or five years, we, we create a new state out of an existing state. Mm -hmm. So India is a really, really evolving and a complex uh, uh, political and economic structure. Uh, in fact, when uh, Professor Nuruddin was mentioning about uh, Mr. Nehru writing letters to his chief ministers, so his chief ministers is very significant because at the stroke of independence, it was the prime minister. His party was ruling most of the states and the chief ministers were actually nominees of the central government. I mean, he would pick up that so and so would be chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, so he, he or she would become the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. So, or maybe there were certain regional uh, leaders, but most of the leaders had a direct affiliation to the prime minister, and it became even stronger when uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the prime minister. Uh, the regional leadership within within uh, the Congress party was not that strong, and chief ministers were handpicked by the prime minister. And there were times when the entire state governments of opposition, ruled by opposition parties, were dismissed in one stroke. It happened twice uh, in India when uh, the Janata Party came to power and when ultimately Congress came to power. 10, 12, 18 states, the governments were dismissed. No ground just because they had a different political party in power and a, 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 a was called. So Indian governance system has evolved, but there was a time, and now there is a time, when the chief ministers of states are leaders uh, in their own right, and they have emerged, uh, they have got the leadership roles because of their work. M many states have regional parties which are in power. They have no direct affiliation with the party which is ruling the center. Of course, with uh, the current uh, party in power, lots of states are getting, uh, um, the state governments are elected which, which are affiliated to the Bharatiya Janata Party at the central level. So the relationship has been, uh, uh, I mean, changing over a period of time. But the role of states in actually delivery of services and actually delivery of goods for welfare of the people, for charting a growth path, has been really, really big, especially after 91 when the economy opened. The role of states has increased. With the devolution, as Jessica was mentioning, with the 14th Finance Commission recommendation coming and saying that 42%, from 32% to 42%, the devolution of central taxes was increased and the Prime Minister accepted that uh, recommendation, that suddenly gave 10% extra funds to states. But on the other hand, GST has come into force now, with the state taxes getting merged into one single tax regime. So it, on, the, on the one hand, the devolution has increased. On the other hand, the state's authority to give concession on taxes or impose state taxes has gone away. So again, the forces which are uh, working on in counter directions are still happening. So there cannot be any any absolute answer about uh, the the uh, the role uh, and the relationship of states vis-a-vis -vis the center. It it keeps on changing with various steps that are being taken. But one thing that is important is that each state, uh, if it if, if a state had a very effective leadership and an effective leader leading that state. They have, that leadership has made a huge difference. The first chief minister of Himachal Pradesh, when Himachal was formed, the first chief minister of Haryana, Chaudhary Bansilal, when Haryana was formed, they really worked in a manner that these states had a different growth path. They got divided from a larger state. The parent state has been left behind, and the new entities have actually gone much ahead of their parent states. Similarly, when Chhattisgarh was formed out of Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand has been formed out of Bihar, 
Some of the new entities with progressive leadership have really done well. And especially states which were called the Bimaru states, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, and UP, these were the states which were considered to have a Hindu rate of growth. They won't grow. The populations are growing. They were part of the Hindi heartland. Uh, they, don't, they, they did not have a, a coast. They were all landlocked. And uh, high population growths, high incidence of poverty, legacy issues. But when strong leadership came, especially like a state like Madhya Pradesh, when the current chief minister came into power, we were a state known as a state without roads, without power, without uh, infrastructure. But in the last 13 years of his uh, governance, Madhya Pradesh has really, really grown. I mean, this is a state which has uh, almost trebled its per capita income. This is a state which has 24 by 7 power, even to its uh, farthest habitations. It is a state which has built more than 100,000 kilometers of roads. It is a state which has the highest public-private partnership program, the biggest and largest public-private partnership program, cutting across sectors from highways to logistics to um, post-harvest management, smart city, solid waste management. You name a sector, uh, the state has been able to attract private sector investment and uh, growth has uh, come in. Similarly, this state has also demonstrated a social security uh, system where the poorest have been uh, provided uh, basic services either free of cost or at a very concessional rate. Now, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, uh, even the farmers, the farm laborers, uh, unorganized laborers, they have a complete social security network uh, guaranteed by the state government. So if a woman becomes pregnant and she's a laborer, two months of her salary is given by the state so that she can take care of her child. Uh, a 15-day salary is given to her husband so that he can take care of his family. There is a complete uh, security for the education of the child, for the health uh, and the treatment of the family, even if it's required to be done in a private hospital with a higher allocation of funds. The funds are provided by the state government. So similarly, uh, all sectors have been identified, the street vendors, the construction workers. I mean, you name a sector which really needed help, that particular sector of people have been assisted in the in the state, and a very good and uh, large-scale social security program has been set in place. The most remarkable feature has been that uh, Madhya Pradesh has uh, grown at a rate of more than 20 percent per annum for last five years in the agriculture sector. I mean, that is that is kind of a miracle because no region in the world could grow at. 20% uh, in agriculture. I mean, the agriculture growth rates could be 2 or 3%. But we have raised our irrigation potential from 7.5 lakh hectares to 40 lakh hectares. That is a short irrigation. We are now going for another 20 lakh hectares on micro-irrigation. Our uh, cropping pattern has changed from a single cropped uh, area. We are now raising three crops uh, in a season. We are having huge uh, agriculture markets uh, in place. Of course, we have challenges on, uh, still challenges on logistics. We have still challenges on value addition in agri and horticulture produce. So lots of work has still to be done, but lots of work has already been done. And there is a clear roadmap how the state is uh, going to uh, deliver goods to its citizens. In the urban space, as uh, Dr. Jessica was saying, uh, Madhya Pradesh has taken Government of India programs as an opportunity. In fact, MP is the only state where uh, we could get all our seven smart cities included in the first two challenges itself. Uh, this, uh, these uh, smart cities have special purpose vehicle companies which are fully empowered and they're completely decentralized. In Tamil Nadu, it's the principal secretary of the department, a guy sitting in my chair who chairs these companies. But in Madhya Pradesh, it is the city head the municipal commissioner and the district collector who head these companies. So there is nobody from the state except for our representative directors who go to the company's boards. The companies are completely independent. They are fully, they are properly funded. They are professionally managed. We have hired people from, from the private sector, from the market as chief knowledge officers, as chief operating officers. We have uh, young uh, uh, Indian administrative service officers and state administrative services officers who are acting as chief executive officers of these companies. And we've got independent directors from uh, outside. So the structure is such that uh, we, we've been able to vet both the, uh, the authority structure of the state as well as the, the private sector initiative. And 
the the most important aspect of financial planning for our cities is that we have divided the projects uh, of the cities in three parts. First part is those projects which require public funding, which don't have a, a, sh a short term or a long term uh, provision of return of capital or, it, or or a revenue stream, where we need actually a grant to 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 do those projects. The second are those projects which have a long term uh, vision of revenue stream which can be funded by municipal bonds, which can be funded through multilateral funding, where we know that if a fund is raised, we can repay that fund out of the resources that will be raised through the project. And third are those projects which we can do on public-private partnerships, where the private sector would be interested to come and work with us. So in all these three aspects, when we divided our projects, the fund outlay has become really huge because uh, one dollar is actually going, to, uh, is, uh, going a long way to attract another nine dollars either through public investment or through investment uh, under bonds and uh, fundraising or through public-private partnerships. Actually, in the last dinner I was, last night's dinner, I was giving an example of a project where we had to set up smart pools and uh, smart lights along with OFC cables with eight services embedded in these smart pools in the city of Bhopal. So my consultants prepared a project of 600 crore Indian rupees to be invested to do that project. Uh, we identified three revenue streams for that project. One was the saving on energy because we were converting all our street lights into LED with smart lighting initiative. The second was uh, the, uh, the connectivity, the telecom connectivity on smart poles. That was a revenue stream for, uh, for a service provider. And the third was the advertisement mandate that we gave on the smart poles, the electronic advertisement uh, billboards. With that built in, when we went for a PPP tender, we actually got a reverse bid. So instead of investing 600 crores, we are getting 47 crores for the city. And the city is getting the infrastructure. We are getting 100 free Wi-Fi points for the city. We're getting 10% of the bandwidth in the OFC cable for the city use. And we're getting a complete infrastructure laid without a single penny going from the coffers of the city or the smart city company. So with these kind of models, now we have uh, envisaged investment of about 12 to 13 billion US dollars. Uh, in our towns and uh, in our smart cities. We have 379 municipal towns, including uh, 16 municipal corporations, which are larger towns. So what I find uh, is, in fact, in the morning when uh, Dan was uh, coordinating the session, the most, uh, the most striking aspect was converting billions into trillions is, of course, on one side, uh, US is taking initiative, various development agencies are taking uh, initiative, there are pension funds, there are investors who can look at uh, the developing world. But there also has to be an initiative from the uh, public sector in this part of the world to take advantage of these initiatives. And our policy and our structure should enable the raising of capital and creating assets which are sustainable both financially as well as uh, physically over a long period of time so that the investments that come in, they have a uh, identified revenue stream and they have a, uh, a, a return that, that an investor would look at. And if we can structure these kind of projects, actually we can uh, have a lot of investment. One uh, point I wanted to answer to Dr. Irfan, in fact, in India, it's, uh, the, there, is no, there, is, there is complete separation of legislature and executive is not there as it is in US. Uh, in US, a legislator cannot become a minister or a, or a head of an executive agency. But in India, all the ministers of the government are actually legislators. So uh, under the Indian constitution, only a legislator can become a minister. So it's a matter of chance that uh, Dr. Irfan's team didn't meet any minister. But in <laughs> India, the, the government is the municipal minister and the principal secretary. So if you, if you uh, have a policy decision to be made, so if I and my minister agree, then the policy decision is taken. If we disagree on a particular issue, then the matter goes in coordination to the chief secretary and to the chief minister. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. The principal secretary of a department cannot work without the cooperation of his minister or without the uh, support of his minister. And of course, the minister also cannot work without the support of his principal secretary. So the permanent executive and the political executive, they have to work uh, hand in hand. That is how the system is. And of course, the prime minister and chief minister are the, uh, are the uh, kind of uh, main uh, political executive who, who lead the governments at the central and the state level. 
but uh, i really appreciate cis uh, csis for uh, recognizing the role of states in uh, the development push that india is going to have and uh, of course there is there is no doubt that uh, uh, at in 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 the present times uh, the states would have uh, even a bigger role uh, to play uh, to to create infrastructure to have better services and to contribute to the growth of the of their own state and that in turn would of course contribute to the growth of the country oh, great thanks for that <laughs> And uh, let me hand it over now to Rajiv uh, from the government of Assam, and uh, great to hear from you, and thanks again for making the trip out here. With all of you, um, Vivek has just narrated the case of Madhya Pradesh quite exhaustively. And uh, I would say that uh, Madhya Pradesh is a state which is already well on its way to development. It's made a very promising start and it's uh, gained considerable ground thanks to all the developments that Vivek was talking about. We in Assam, however, are just getting our act going. And uh, there's a long history behind it. Um, for those of you who are not aware of, uh, of, of Assam, uh, let me just in tell you that Assam is basically a, a small state of 31 million, small by Indian standards, but it's got a population of 31 million, and it's tucked away in the northeastern corner of, of the country. It shares a, a border with Bangladesh and with Bhutan, and is, I would say, within dry, you know, a day's driving distance from Tibet and also from, from Myanmar and, and Nepal as well. Um, it's a state which is actually quite richly endowed uh, with resources. Um, it is principally known for its tea. I don't know if those who are, of you uh, who are tea drinkers here will be knowing something about Assam tea. That's where uh, the British had found tea, and I think that was the principal reason why Assam came under the colonial administration. Uh, anyway, as of today, it produces about 50% of India's tea. It's also known for its oil. Uh, Asia's first oil refinery came up in Digboy in Assam, and it is still functional. It's also known for, well, it's got limestone reserves, it's got um, uh, coal, and it's very well known for its bio the biodiversity, for its forests, for its wildlife. And so there's a lot of potential for Assam. But then the last uh, two, three decades have actually got wasted by uh, wasted i would say but in in many ways it is also had a positive impact uh, because it was affected very seriously by social unrest social and ethnic unrest and then subsequently by a prolonged period of insurgency now, assam is one of the most diverse states in the country we have about say practically speaking about not less than about 35 to 40 ethnic groups and uh, there are many other minor groups there. So if you add them all, it'll come to at least 60 odd groups in Assam itself. And each district, each province, uh, each, each district or each county, I would say, the, the, the US equivalent is a county. Each county in, in Assam has a different kind of a population composition. So when you're talking about India being diverse, then there are some states like Assam which are within the state itself show an enormous amount of diversity. I belong to Assam, but I did not know about this kind of diversity until I became Home Secretary. It is only when I became Home Secretary and I had to deal with each district issues by itself, then I realized that the extent of diversity which is there. Now, uh, we have about, say, 55 odd languages, spoken languages and dialects. Uh, and as per the linguistic survey of the country, Linguistically, Assam is the second most diverse state in the country after Arunachal Pradesh, which, well, which is a neighboring state of ours on the China border, which China is claiming. Um, well, uh, coming back to the uh, thing about, about government of India and, uh, and the state governments, uh, let me just uh, narrate to you some of my experiences when I was there as, as finance secretary. During the late 90s and early 2000s, that's the, the, over the period 98 to about say 2003, I happened to be finance commissioner 
of Assam. And that was one of the most fiscally, I think, difficult times uh, in, in Assam's uh, administrative history. That was a time when we didn't have enough money to pay the, the salaries, not enough money to release for the development projects that Government of India was releasing to us, the funds that were being released to us, and, and much of the funds that Government of India was releasing was actually being diverted to pay salaries. So as a result of that, we could not you know, give the utilization certificates, which are essential for the release of funds. I mean, every time you, you release funds for, for, for a particular program, the government of India quite justifiably will ask for its utilization certificate. Now, if you're being, uh, if you're diverting the funds to salaries out of necessity, then you don't have enough money for, for, for development work itself. As a result of which, we can't submit the, the certificates, and so the entire flow of funds would get choked. So that is, uh, as far as those days, you know, the uh, the cycle uh, of planned funding. But this has now. Uh, been removed to, to a large extent, although the system of UCs or utilization certificates still continues. But at the same time, each government gets an allocation from the, from, the, from the Finance Commission. Now, Finance Commission grant is meant to be covering what is known as the non-plan gap. Non-plan gap or the establishment. Whatever it is, money you have for salaries is, and for other, other expenses is meant to be meant from the state's own resources as well as from what it gets from the Finance Commission. Now, people say the Finance Commission are basically centers, fund, centers money. Actually, it is not, because as per the constitutional devolution, you know, the, the collection of those funds is basically from various states. And then, since it is collectively, uh, you know, since it is collected centrally, it falls upon the center to, to, to distribute the funds among the states. So actually, it is it's the state's funds. But now what happened is that as a result of, you know, of this acute fiscal stress when I was uh, responsible for the, uh, for, for, the, for the payment of salaries and all that, there was delay and then uh, there was acute ag agitation. So I had to go to the center every, to Delhi every week, literally with requests uh, for early release of funds. That's when people started to say that See, look at the state government is beginning to go with a begging bowl to the, to, to, to the center. So uh, that was one example, I would say, of how you know, center-state relations are perceived. In reality, I would have to say that the center was very helpful. It was, was very helpful to us. They kind of bent backwards to accommodate our requirements. They gave us advanced release of funds. And uh, not only that, you know, we entered into an MOU with, 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 uh, with the center. I mean, a medium-term fiscal reforms program was, 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 uh, was drafted. And uh, the, the government of India assisted us in providing funds for that. And also, uh, certain provisions of that, of that uh, medium-term fiscal reform programs locally would have been unpalatable because it meant compression of expenditure. It meant complete, you know, um, cessation of recruitments, filling up of posts, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, without the center's intervention, it would not have been possible to actually implement that. But with the center, we, you know, center's assistance, we were able to uh, get the funds. We were able to also then thereafter move the ADB, Asian Development Bank, and we entered in negotiations for support from the Asian Development Bank, not only for fiscal restructuring, but also for the power sector restructuring. Now, what the state government wants to do is, of course, within the, uh, it is to be determined by the, by the state. And the center plays a supportive role. Sometimes it does not, especially when you have you know, different parties who are in power at, uh, in the state and center. But uh, I would say that nowadays, you know, the voters also in the state have become smart in the sense that if they see, to a large extent, that let's say one party is in power in the center, they tend to also vote for a similar party in the state. At least in the Northeast, that, that is the pattern that we have been observing. So as a result, you, know, you, you tend to have uh, governments which are on the same wavelength. Now, that is actually, in a way, it's, it's helpful to us because not only for the, supply, for, for, the, for, the, for the supply of funds, and funds are the, are the main things which that state governments really rely on, on the center, uh, but also for, for the fact that Many of the central schemes which are actually designed for the states, like for instance, in, in the power sector, we have the Deendal Upadhyay Gram Jyoti Yojana, which is basically a 
program of rural elect electrification. Similarly, there are many other, uh, other, other programs which are there by, of, of the center uh, cutting across all departments and, sector and sectors. Uh, the design of these, to a large extent now, while there may be a central design as such, which may be, uh, you know, earlier that used to be one size fit all kind of a thing, but there is scope for, for, for regional variation, for state-wise variation. So if you are from the state government side, you make a convincing uh, plea, you can always, uh, you can make uh, certain adjustments in those programs, uh, which will suit the state circumstances and needs. And accordingly, you know, you get funds for those. Um, now, uh, I would say that all in all, one has found that as far as the northeastern states are concerned, uh, earlier the perception might have been different because of which there was widespread social unrest. In fact, uh, in the 60s and 70s, people were of the opinion that you know, the center was exploiting the states for its resources and state was getting nothing back in return. But now I would say that is not true. We are getting a uh, fair amount of funds. May not be enough for our requirements because having actually lagged behind in the, in the development process because of social unrest and insurgency, now it has become imperative for us to actually give a fillip to the development process, to meet the needs of the people, to meet the aspirations of the people. If we are unable to do that, then it's, there's a danger of the situation again relapsing. So where we might actually, actually go back to a, to a situation where there is even deeper alienation, which neither the state government nor the central government can afford. Uh, so at this stage, actually, while we get funds from the center, it is very important for the state also to come up with not only viable projects, but also projects which are basically you know, uh, able to secure funds from other sources. For us now in, in Assam, uh, the primary source of funds apart from the center as, as such are the, are the externally aided projects. Uh, presently in Assam, we have about say 20 odd ongoing externally aided projects. Another 10 to 15 are in the anvil. And apart from that, uh, what is actually, you know, I would say, a mark of the change in times, because this has never be happened before in Assam. Um, earlier governments were not really keen on uh, wooing uh, private investment. But this government has actually changed all that. Recently, we had uh, a, a business summit, which is known by Advantage Assam. And in that uh, summit, uh, um, Practically, in the entire corporate, you know, let's say I would say the who's who of India's corporate uh, sector turned up, and uh, there were as many as about say 260 odd MOUs signed for projects uh, amounting to about say 12 to 13 billion US dollars. So for Assam, that's a that's a very big amount. I mean, in, given the fact that after uh, the establishment of tea and oil industries, there has been very little private investment as such. So for us now, actually. The job is on, you know, on one hand to actually uh, to step up the development process, but with it, the employment generation. Because, you see, uh, the lack of, uh, of employment in Assam has really created this, uh, this law and order scenario, uh, because of which we've had this, uh, I would say, alienation, sense of, sense of uh, not I wouldn't say alienation, but uh, sense of resentment. And uh, so if we are able to create jobs for, 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 uh, for, uh, for the people of Assam, A, it will take care of that. And secondly, it would actually stop the brain drain which is going on right now. Presently, you will find that people of Assam and Northeast are migrating to all other parts of the country in search of jobs. So you will find Assamese boys who are there in Hyderabad, who are there in Bengaluru, who are there in Cochin, who are there in Chennai, not to speak of Delhi and and other you know, near cities, wherever, uh, let's say, economic growth has, uh, is, is quite vibrant. So on one hand, you know, we have to you know, step up the, uh, uh, the investments and with it, the economic growth and more importantly, employment generation. But at the same time, we also have to put, I, I would say, sufficient stress on, uh, on uh, this point had been made earlier, on citizen service delivery and on governance so that the local uh, people's you know, uh, day to day requirements are met. Uh, we have actually, uh, some time back, uh, like some of other states, um, uh, 
legislated the right to public services act and also we have put into force uh, we have made arrangements for online distribution of citizen service uh, citizen services a point had made also been made about about uh, about the g2b side and uh, we'd be ha you'd be happy to know that as far, as far as let's say the ease of doing business is concerned um, and now assam has picked up and we are one of the top performing states uh, in that regard um, of course there's lots to be said now my my presentation or my discussion here is some somewhat uh, unstructured but uh, i would like to say that you know uh, responding to what was discussed in the plenary session today among other things you see what we need is not just funds we need funds for sure but we apart from that we need to need a fair amount of technical assistance now in states today we need actually know what the best practices are you want to do some something when there's no time to experiment today if you know that there is something which is which is happening somewhere else and it's and is working out then it's uh, that might be a good model to replicate in the state so we need to know about uh, a what are the best practices elsewhere and b we need to have let's say capacity development and when we talk about capacity development in the in the state in the states now madhya pradesh and other states might be better and out than us uh, for us actually you can say ideas are there there are plenty of ideas there uh, are there for developing uh, a state or or any particular sector but then you know it, it comes down to how are you going to do it so if you are to actually conceptualize design and plan properly then that's half the job done if if it can be done properly and at the same time if you are able, able to implement the scheme now implementation is uh, is is a, is a major challenge because simply you know speaking we don't have people uh, uh, who are trained who have the capacity to do that effectively in the field so it's a, it's a major challenge and i would say that when we talk about let's say you know uh, about development assistance i would say that capacity building technical assistance would be uh, you know just as important as the, the financial part uh the other uh, other things also um while uh, yes yes i i will just say one more one more thing i'll just end out here it is vital for us actually also to think about you know what the local people uh, want for you know for too long we have been actually been you know been been preparing and uh, implementing rather imposing projects on 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 people when they may not really be wanted you know they might be small or big projects so it's very important for us really to know depending upon what the circumstances are what the needs are and feelings of people are what what would actually be suit them uh, of course that will be given uh, other other parameters also but by and large this should be something very important so uh, when we talk about capacity for planning designing we have to keep this in mind actually the sensitivity factor comes in very you know comes in a big way and especially for for a state like assam so i i will i, I will end out here but uh, i will just say that we are one of the first states to uh, to um, to incorporate the sustainable development goals in our in our, in our budgeting um we have uh, prepared all departments all 52 departments have prepared a seven year action seven year strategy and a three year action plan for the implementation of sustainable development goals and that is basically going to be guiding us uh, thank you thank you well i don't want to hold people uh, too long before lunch but uh, we'll try to grab a couple of questions um, the last thing i'm going to do is turn to each of the panelists too and for our two from state governments i want each of them to give their top line thought if a us institution whether it's a university a foundation uh, some organization comes to you looking to partner with your state, what is the one single thing that a foreign institution should think about before showing up at a state and looking to partner? Because there is a, a long road of U.S. institutions that have failed to commit, you know, to get MOUs done. So, so what, what's your top line thought 
uh, and also, you know, Jessica and Irfan, having, having done a lot of work with state governments, what's your one thought, too, one piece of advice you can get, just one bullet point for a U.S. institution that's going to a state that you've got to have in mind first and foremost, whether it's health care, power, whatever it is. Um, we, got, we got a chance to grab just uh, one or two questions. Maybe I'll grab uh, a couple, and we can throw them open to the panel. Uh, I also want to recognize, too, if you get a chance to pull his arm at uh, lunch here, um, you know, uh, Pradeep Mehta, uh, who runs Cuts, which is a terrific Jaipur-based think tank, uh, is here as well. So not, not the only person on stage here that uh, visited all the way from India. So Pradeep, thanks for coming. Uh, but let me first turn to his colleague, Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor, uh, for, for a question. So we'll make them quick, please. Uh, if you can uh, let us know uh, who you are, uh, make, make it quick, and I'll grab a couple of these, and then we'll, uh, we'll roll from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm Pradeep Kapoor. I'm Professor at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm the head of the CUTS Washington DC Center, which we are launching today with your support, Rick. Thank you for that. I compliment uh, CSIS for this Global Development Forum. Very good job. Amazing. And what I like even more is the focus on India. It's only country focus. There are regional focuses, sectoral aspects being discussed the whole day today. But congratulations for that also. Great job. Now, I, you know, also compliment all the speakers on the panel for the great interventions. Awesome. My question is to Dr. Irfan Nuruddin. Uh, we have you know, seen, and what Rick just mentioned, about what is that one message which you want to give. Now, for the US-India partnership, and we hear a lot of talk, even at CSIS, about whether it can become the defining partnership for the 21st century. That's the aspiration. But can it really become? What are the impediments? Are there sufficient cultural understandings on the two sides? Do we understand the cultural upbringing aspects of the two countries? So what are we doing to make the dialogue smoother at every level? Because I have been working as Deputy Secretary of Americas in the Ministry of External Affairs. I was in the Foreign Service before joining the University of Maryland. And as Deputy Secretary of Americas, I participated in meetings with U.S. ambassadors and Indian uh, you know, leaders where the meetings just fall through the cracks completely and nothing happens. And that's been happening even today, in spite of all the efforts being made by the two sides. So over to you, Dr. Nuruddin. Yeah, let's Thank just you. grab one more. I saw Jonathan, I think, has end up. Yeah, so we'll take this one last one. Uh, again, make it pretty quick, please, yes. and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Ward. Uh, <laughs> let's go for this. Whoever figures out how to fix Thank the you. microphones the time, they're the next billionaire. <laughs> well, here we are. So, uh, Jonathan Ward, Atlas Organization. I work on India-China relations. I wanted to ask uh, Shri Bora about the, to, to go into a little more detail about the question of insurgency in Assam and how that might compare to insurgency, sort of the history of insurgency elsewhere in India. Thank you. Okay, so we'll grab those two, and then I'll go to my one last point lightning round I mentioned before. So Irfan, uh, real quick, what are we missing? What can we do better on the relationship overall? And uh, Mr. Bora on the insurgency. Uh, Ambassador, nice to see you again. Thank you for your question. Uh, so I agree. I think uh, the U.S.-India relationship has the potential for being a critical one, but I think the gap between understanding and actually interests is much wider than the top line rhetoric suggests. I mean, I think for the for the United States, at least at the very highest levels, India is seen as a partner really to counter China uh, in the Asia Pacific. And I don't think Indian politicians want to leave one hyphenated relationship with Pakistan to enter into another hyphenated relationship. Mm -hmm. I think India aspires to be treated on its own merits and its own interests. And I'm not sure that that understanding has entered Washington, D.C. yet. Um, that's one. I think the other thing, and you know, maybe as I was listening to uh, Vivek, all of us on security are plugging our ears when he says, "Yeah, that. yeah." <laughs> as I was listening to uh, Vivek's uh, talk, I mean, you know, he's uh, maybe instead of reading Nehru's little letters, what we should all be doing is watching Yes Minister one more time, <laughs> right, to really understand this, because that gap between the permanent executive and the political executive, um, and the way that works, is critical to understanding India. But it's so alien to the American way of thinking about administrative structure. And so I think the notion that, you know, a, a chief secretary is really the person you need to talk to and convince as opposed to some person who might be much more sort of 
your equivalent. You, you know, I think a lot of the folks in America want to say, I'll go talk to the chief minister, but they don't have, understand that they have to talk also to the principal secretary. Uh, the, no, how to engage that bureaucracy, and I think maybe I'll give away my top line, but I think most American institutions simply don't understand the Indian bureaucracy. And if you don't understand the Indian bureaucracy, you can't get work done in India. And we got to fix that and we got to educate. And of course, the work Rick's doing here at CSIS is incredible public good because it's educating a generation of uh, American policymakers to understand India better through that particular lens. Thanks. Great. Uh, Rajiv? Yep. Well, um, before I answer that question, I just wanted to respond to what Rick had said about that one single thing that you know, we should keep in mind. <coughs> To my mind, the most important thing is to get uh, any project approved as quickly as possible. What happens is that normally, you know, if you go to a multilateral institution, I won't take names here, it can take up to two to three years before the project goes through and funding is actually approved. In that time, those who were actually looking after the project, who were champions of the project, would have got transferred. Mm. So when, when actually the time for implementation starts, you have a different set of people there altogether, and they may not share the same amount of commitment, same amount of passion as the, as the, the champions would have. Okay. Uh, coming to uh, um, um, the insurgency issue, now this is a, quite a complicated issue. It's not just confined to Assam, but practically all the northeastern states, if, if you are familiar with uh, the other states uh, of the region. But I will make it as briefly, as brief as possible. Principally speaking, in Assam, the, the cause of insurgency was basi basically an identity issue. It's caused by the large-scale influx, influx of immigrants from across the border, from East Bengal, East Pakistan, Bangladesh, whatever you call it. So much so that about uh, uh, maybe 10 to 12 districts in the state have had to undergo complete uh, democratic uh, transformation. Now, uh, the immigrants are in a majority in, the, in, those, in those districts. So uh, this was basically, I would say, widely perceived uh, to be something which would threaten the identity of the local SMEs, their language, their, their, uh, their, 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 their uh, access to political power, their, their, um, uh, their chances of getting, securing employment, and so on and so forth. So that was the prime reason. But the other reasons are also there. That, you know, the government was not functioning, I would say, sufficiently sensitively, which I mentioned uh, in, my, in my remarks. It was not uh, functioning sufficiently sensitively, nor was it for functioning efficiently. So service delivery, governance were, were, were not up to the mark. Apart from that, well, very little development had taken place because of which employment generation was quite uh, limited. And uh, when you have large numbers of, of people uh, were unemployed, boys were unemployed, then uh, they can easily go astray. So uh, these are the three, uh, three prime factors. One is because of identity, the other one is about governance issues, third is about development and lack of employment uh, opportunities. Well, we're running into lunch, so let me, uh, let me leave that last word I mentioned uh, for Jessica and for Vivek since they didn't have other questions. What is the top line, the most important thing, if you're looking to cooperate, if you're a development organization to cooperate with the state government, and uh, your experience in that, uh, that as well. So, uh, so sure. Jessica, go ahead, and then Vivek. Sure. Uh, first is listen and respect. The person you're dealing with is probably smarter than you and probably knows the answer and does not need you to show up and tell them the solution. Second is be useful. Understand the constraints. Do more than meet the minister, the MLA, and with all due respect, more than the principal secretary. Go down into the engineering level, the implementation level. And lastly and most importantly, don't claim credit. Great. Thank you. Vivek. So um, I'll just give an example. We were looking for uh, uh, healthcare professionals who are part of the Indian diaspora in uh, US to work with us. There was a guy called Dr. Prakash Satwani, who is uh, who's a specialist in bone marrow transplant in Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in New York. So he was ready to do it. We were trying to find a way to collaborate with the hospital. So the basic thing that uh, came in the way was that how to compensate the hospital for the time that Dr. Satwani is going to give to Madhya Pradesh for setting up the bone marrow transplant center. So I was the guy who went for negotiating with, the, with his head of department. And it was a real difficult negotiation because uh, the HOD was saying that even if Dr. Satwani goes, 
in his holiday time in his vacation time still his time is taken and for that time the hospital or the institution needs to be compensated so it took me about 3 months to convince him and and get him across that we will pay for the expenses that are to be borne by the uh, by the facility but otherwise let dr satwani do the work for us and finally we now have a bone marrow transplant center in one of our government medical colleges in indore uh, as a collaboration with the uh, morgan stanley children's hospital so the issue uh, in india is the when when we enter into a partnership there is a issue of transparency how to enter into a partnership with a uh, with an institution which is coming to partner with us if there is a financial implication so if there is a financial implication there is a procurement process that has to be gone through and if somebody enters into mou and pays for a service or pays for a collaboration it just can't happen in india i mean the accountability issues are very very high even if or everybody is well meaning tomorrow there can be questions asked i mean india is as as uh, good or bad as us is in on accountability issues so the basic thing when an when a us institution comes to work with any uh, university or with a maybe an incubation center with a smart city with a city municipal corporation or with the state government is that the financial situation has to be clear up front because there is always uh, a cost involved for an institution to come and work uh, with the, with another institution in india and how that cost is to be uh, paid back or how that cost is to be incorporated into the project that has to be built in if that part is taken care of then it's very easy to enter into partnerships and work uh, i have been trying to have partnerships with universities for for uh, technical advancement for setting up laboratories in our engineering institutions or in our uh, industrial training institutes we've been trying to have partnerships for our hospitals we've been having as i said uh, we had one successful partnership we've been trying to have uh, partnerships for getting uh, technical assistance for cities but then these partnerships whenever there is a financial involvement then the the receiving side that the indian side has to go through a procurement process so that is that is the only stumbling block otherwise the willingness from both sides is very high uh, people are ready to come in but there is a business aspect of uh, working with uh, american institutions and that business aspect has to be properly accounted for when we enter into a partnership that's a great thought well india's development trajectory is critical for human development overall india's development trajectory goes through her states and here you had people on the inside and the outside that have been there for successful partnerships go fast be respectful engage at multiple levels uh bring international examples and competencies when you can know the processes and know the finances and understand how that piece works too so if we're going to make this work um we got two great individuals here hopefully you'll have a little time to engage them at lunch lunch runs until 1:00 o'clock uh, 12:00 12:00 oh boy so grab one fast and give please join me and give them a welcome yeah a, a big thanks